It is another week in the book of 1 Corinthians, but this time it is a chapter which people know and love. Those of you that have been following along in 1 Corinthians know that 1 Corinthians is a really difficult book. It is full of um, questions, accusations, assertions, and then Paul answering those in turn. And if you lose that thread, then you really lose 1 Corinthians. And I've heard Paul quoted as Paul says when he was quoting them, not him. Uh, and we need to always remember this. And also remember that it has been really difficult until we get to chapter 13. And chapter 13 is not, however, this big I, I love you thing dropped in. And then we go to another subject. This is wrapped around the subject that he's been coming at for, for several chapters and that he will go back to. He hasn't even left this discussion because he's still talking about people who are disruptive in worship in that uh, it's all about them. Those who are wealthy, refusing to share their food with others and instead making the Lord's Supper somewhat of a contest of who has the biggest meal and the preciousness of the food. He's, he's had to deal with them doing factions of, well, no, I believe, you know, I was baptized by this guy. Well, I was baptized by this guy. It's all a mess and he's trying to solve it. So how does he solve it? Does he give us a list of rules that says, all right, everybody, this is what you are to say when you worship. This is what you are to do when you worship. Here are the, here's a laid out worship service for you. No. Well, did he go in and say, well, you're going to have to clean some house and hold people tight to and do a doctrinal survey to see, make sure that the people that are coming here believe all the right things. No. Well, how is Paul going to deal with all of this? He's going to show them that there is something more powerful than themselves, something more powerful than their rules and their predetermined ideas, something more powerful than their wants and their needs, something so powerful that if you don't have it, it ruins even the good work that you are doing. It's all about love. Let's look at it. First Corinthians 13 if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Okay. The tongues of men or of angels. And the word angels there, we do not have enough of a context to know if he's speaking of heavenly angels or earthly ones. Remember that the word angelos, angel, means messenger. And this is never more clearly illustrated than in the first chapter of Galatians, where he says... Um, you know, though I or an angel from heaven speak to you. And he, and he goes at it twice. You know, if anyone says anything to you different than Jesus, he's anathema, though I or an angel from heaven. So he's using the word angels in both ways there. We don't really know here. And, and I've had people ask me questions about speaking in tongues. It is not a phenomena which I have ever experienced uh, personally. I've been around it many times. I don't believe that that's what is given to us as gifts, but I would never, ever um, question somebody's salvation or their devotion to God. And I will also never tell them to quit praying the way they pray. And you see, that's just not my job. My job is to, hang on, you can fill in the blank, love them, talk about Jesus. But what he's saying here is you can come whether in incredibly sharp language and beautiful language. But if there's no love, it's just a bunch of noise. Or if you come, let's say it's, an, it's, a, it's a heavenly tongue. When you speak, it echoes around the room. But you don't have love? No. It means nothing. It's just noise. Very much like when you see people on television demanding this, accusing that. Um, you know, oh, it's just, it's noise because there's no love there. It is clanging cymbals, resounding gongs, and nothing else. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy 
and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and have a faith that moves mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Uh, pro the prophecy clause is not the same as the fathom all mysteries and all knowledge um, clause. The word prophet in scripture meant somebody who proclaimed the word of God, a message of God in public. And prophecy is more preaching than it is foretelling the future or uh, uncovering secret things. Uh, I brought this up before, about 20, 25% of all prophets in all prophecies, all things said by prophets, we'll get there, in the Old Testament were about the future. More than three quarters were about living righteous lives now. And that was done in public, therefore they're prophets. But there are others who, they can figure out mysteries and there are others with amazing knowledge. And these, very often, they're not all in the same package. It's another reason why we need the community. We need a, um, several verse, uh, voices around us. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, uh, and I have seen this, I've seen people have a faith in God, and sadly, a faith in their system that was so powerful, they did great things. And then... It all fell apart because there wasn't love there. I am, <clears throat> I'm in the unenviable position of being given um, clips of people preaching. And people are saying, what, what does this mean? Is this, and it's amazing the hate, the anger, the demands that come from the pulpit. I, I can remember once, <clears throat> this was uh, years before things like YouTube and uh, Roku and the like. And so I was on the road again. I was in a hotel. It was in a, t uh, a uh, East Tennessee city and turned on the television. Now, if you've ever been in a hotel back in those days, you know it was painful trying to change channels to find something to watch because you didn't have a guide what was going on. And so mainly what you got was commercial, commercial, commercial. In this town, they had three different religious TV stations. All of them, whenever I would flip past them, had people yelling, anger, making smart, snarky comments, just being sarcastic. <clears throat> and I was thinking if I was just a person, not already a believer, there's no way I'd become one. Because look at this, if this is what I know of Christianity, if this is all I've seen, I'm going to run away from it. It doesn't really matter if those people that are talking have a lot of knowledge. It doesn't really matter if they know mysteries or have the gift of prophecy. Or, no, there's no love there. Run. And many of us in uh, our Safe Harbor Church came from churches that were harmful or that were cold. Not all of us, but I, I, I read your emails and I respond to them. I, I, I hear what you'd say and I believe it because I grew up on the far right as well and harm caused there. We believed in our system. We had huge faith in our system. And if we applied our system, whether it was doing the film strips or the, the cottage Bible studies, the home Bible studies or whatever, and it didn't produce fruit, we always blame the tree. <laughs> it, our system is perfect. That person just isn't. It, it's kind of like if a rocket scientist were able to get away with that, you flip the switch and the rocket doesn't go anywhere, and you go, well, the thing is, we did everything perfectly. The rocket is just being resistant. If you don't have love, there's no launch. He goes, if I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship, or in King James, to be burned. Uh, it's, it's a weird Greek word phrasing. Paul likes to do those kind of things. It really means to, to wear one out, self out, to put oneself in harm's way, to uh, overdo the work. Give my body over to hardship that I may boast. Oh. So it wasn't. It wasn't for Jesus, it was for you then. Hmm. But I have not love, I gain nothing. 
Wow. You know, we could stay there for quite some time and just be in quiet and look at each other. Well, we'll move on. What is love like? Because here's the thing. I have received so many emails, letters, and discussions in the last 40 years of my life where somebody who is about to rain manure all over me and my ministry starts off with, now, Brother Mead, we love you. And you need to know, we, we love you. And then the dump truck opens. I've had many people do things intentionally to harm me and my ministry. Only a few of them physical. Um, yeah, death threats, but that was years ago. Uh, more reputation killer type things. And one of the things they always say, they always say is, well, we love Patrick. But love doesn't do what they're doing, though. I never respond in kind. I've never tried to take their reputation down. Or, in fact, I refuse to debate them. And if you're wondering, what do they have against me? It's, it's all about I'm, I disappointed a lot of people by not staying on the right of my religious tribe, preaching the standard agreed but unwritten creed, and holding fast to the traditions of the ancient fathers of my church that were only 100, 150 years before me. Uh, so not, not too ancient. Um, I didn't do that. And because of that, I disappointed them. They got angry. It became dangerous. And I've asked them many times, what, what am I doing that's hurting you? And really what it all comes down to is I'm showing people that they can be free in Christ. And that threatens their their entire flock, because if the sheep hear about that, they're leaving. Well, okay. I don't think I've tried to harm anybody. But regardless, love, don't dress up love and say, I'm doing this because I love you. I've seen children bruised with cuts because their dad beat them and said he did it out of love. That's not love. I've had more women than I can count, counseled with them who still had bruises from their husband and saying, but I know he loves me. No, no, he doesn't. What is love? Love is patient. Well, it has to be, doesn't it? Because no two people are alike, which means none of us are going to be moving at the same speed as the other one. If you don't believe me, enter any mall. Remember malls? Malls were fun. It does, and love is kind, now, kindness is different than goodness. Goodness is you're doing something to benefit another. Let's say I write a check um, to feed the people of Haiti, or I write a check to help doctors go to a, a place where there's been a tsunami. That's good. Kindness is doing good to the people who are right in front of you, within your reach. They are your kind because they're in your area, not your kind because of race or, um, or whatever. It's kind because this is the person in front of you. Love takes care of that person. So you can't say, well, I love everybody, but this person doesn't. No, this is the person in front of you. Love them. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. All of these things were happening in Corinth. They were boasting, they were envious, they were proud, they were angry, they were divided. And so he's going, listen, it does not dishonor others. So none of those questions, these conversations with, I love you, but no, you don't get to do that. You don't get to dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Now that's a hard one. Um, I'm as selfish as anybody. I really wish I weren't. There are a lot of times, however, I find that I'm doing some really good things. And the reason I chose to do those really good things is because it'll reflect well on me or uh, I get something out of it. You, you can't help getting blessed when you're blessing others, but that should not be your driving force. And so I always have to be thinking, am I wanting to buy this or am I wanting to do this for Jesus or is that for me? Uh, it's one of those things I ask myself a lot. <clears throat> it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
please, please, please go back to the Clothed with Christ series and listen to forgiveness so that you understand that forgiveness does not mean forgetting. But here, it just means you don't keep a list of the wrong they've done in your pocket, ready to bring it out and list it. You know, I, I love Proverbs chapter six, where it talks about the, the things that God hates. The reason I love it is because it reminds me of my dear sweet mother. Because when I was a boy, now she'll tell you now that I was the perfect person, always have been the perfect person. Um, let's just go with her story, right? <laughs> I wasn't. And in Proverbs 6, God says, there are six things God hates, seven things. God, it's like, oh, I just now thought of another one. And I can remember times my mother would, would say, you know what's wrong with you? There are two things, three things that I need to talk to you about. Fourth, it's just, I was going, you know, I got to get out of this conversation before we hit triple digits. Um, that's not unlove here. She was trying to correct a kid's behavior. But we don't keep record of wrong. And we're not easily angered. If I ask you to list three of your pet peeves, and you can do it, you've got a problem because you're not supposed to be that easily annoyed. It's, um, think about it. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And all of God's people say amen and turn off the different news channels and quit going to certain sites that are highly biased to the right or to the left. And a lot of, almost all of them that say that they're not are. So you need to um, not delight in evil, but rejoice in the truth. What is the truth? What are the numbers? Numbers don't lie. Figures don't lie. But liars figure. So are you getting all the data? Um, it always protects. Always trust. Always hopes and always perseveres. Now, that doesn't even sound ment you know, healthy for a, a mental health aspect for you to walk around always protecting, always trusting, <clears throat> always hoping, and always persevering. But Paul is not speaking into a vacuum here. He is speaking into a city's church that is fractious, contentious, and as I've said several times, is a train wreck hitting a dumpster on fire. So he's saying, back off. Drop the rocks. Understand who you are. <clears throat> Saved by grace, not of yourselves. So stop the boasting. And this is your brother and sister in Christ in front of you. Act accordingly. He goes, love never fails. I've had people say, but I, it did for me. Your love has never failed. The person receiving your love may have failed. We'll, we'll let God call that one. If you were dumped by a husband after you worked hard to get him through med school, you might say love failed. If you married a great Christian woman because you were both in, in love with doing mission work for Jesus, and before you left for your first assignment, she left with the building supervisor, your love didn't fail. Hers did. Understand, it is the strongest tool we've got. It's the most powerful thing in our toolbox. Get it out and use it. But other, all other things fail. Where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, it will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And if you don't believe any of that, just read what was knowledge a few years ago. All right? For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. I do need to, um, to address my religious tribe here. And, not, and it's not just mine. Uh, many of my former tribe, many of my um, Baptist friends and Pentecostal friends and others also have leaders who tell them that in the King James, it is now that which is perfect and perfect means complete or whole has come. Uh, what's in part disappears. And they're trying to say, well, the gift of tongues left and miracles left and everything else left because the Bible was finally come. And therefore, once we have the Bible, then we don't need all of these other things. And then they build huge sermons and theological skyscrapers on that um, spider web. Problem is, it's not what he's talking about. I'm talking about spiritual maturity. 
Well, how do you know you're spiritually mature? When you're marked by love. When people know that's what you talk about and that's what you do. When you're around them, you love them. You, are, you make them the center of your universe because they happen to be present. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Children are notoriously self-centered and who can blame them? They have no idea, they have no control. Um, and by control, it's, it, they don't have much control over themselves. But I'm really talking about they don't have control over the universe. And therefore, they go, I, I don't know what I'm going to eat. I want to eat. But I am not allowed to pick my food or when I get it. You know, it's a frustrating thing to be a child. He's saying, I'm, I'm not self-centered anymore. If you love, you're not self-centered. I reasoned like a child when I became a man. I put the ways of childhood behind me. And now he's going to tell him, you have to love in faith because you might be loving others that are just going to be awful. And you're just going to have to keep it because he goes, well, now that we, don't, we see only a reflection as it's in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am known. In other words, it's going to get to the point where everybody knows everything. And I think we're talking heaven here. And he's saying, uh, and we're still going to love because we're still right there. And then to nail it, he goes, that now only three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. Fill in the blank with me. And the greatest of these is, yeah, love. Do you understand what you just said, though? That means that you believe that love is greater than faith. Love is greater than hope. Paul is pulling out the big gun here. You, if you don't have love, we're done talking with Paul. And by the way, Paul has got some very hard things to say to Corinth next. But we get a lot of that very, very wrong because we keep reading the Bible as if God was now giving us a list of instructions when he's really trying just to get us to stop hurting each other and love one another. But that's for next Wednesday. May God bless you and give you a blessed week.